He used the same form of argument with another very fundamental question, didn't he? And that is um, the question of the self and the continuity of the self. He said that although we take it for granted that we have selves and that we are continuous selves, we discover that we can't actually locate this self in observation or experience. That when we look inside ourselves, what we actually see is individual thoughts, feelings, memories, emotions, and so on. But we don't observe some other entity, a self, that has them. Now, this is a very disconcerting and startling doctrine, isn't it? What were its implications? Well, I think one should add that Hume was never really quite satisfied with this. As you said, he kept on going back when he's giving an account of his theory to the doctrine of causality, because there he felt satisfied. He'd done what he set out to do. He'd shown that there is something about our character as human beings which compels us to believe that things are necessarily connected with one another, even although we don't observe in the world that necessary connection. But it gets terribly difficult when it comes to personal identity. He'd said earlier that in respect to ordinary identity, what happens is something like this. Actually, every time we close our eyes, something dis the thing in front of us disappears. It's no longer there as a perception. But when we open our eyes again, this is very rough and crude, what we see is so similar to what we saw before we close our eyes that we're confused. We treat this as having been an experience of identity we can, we, because it's so like keeping our eyes open all the time and just having a single perception. Now, that's all right, perhaps, in respect to the identity of other people. You might say it's the same sort of thing. We see them today and we see them tomorrow. They're very like one another. The actions that they perform on one occasion have certain sorts of causal connections with the ones they, uh, they uh, have on other occasions. But let's take ourselves. Now, you, you can't say that we become confused between this succession of perceptions and a strict identity, because this assumes that there's some we there all the time to become confused. And that's why Hume says, I think this is why Hume says in the long run that he's very dissatisfied with this. And this really worried him because he'd begun from the assumption that so long as one talked only about the human mind and human perceptions, one wouldn't get into any great intellectual problems or any intellectual confusions which couldn't be easily cleared away. One thing that what he had to say about cause and what he has to say about the self have in common is that in both cases he says... Let's look for the actual observation, the actual experience on which this everyday uh, idea is based. And in each case, when we look for them, we discover to our amazement that they're not there. It's as if he's trying to base his philosophy on fact. Now, is that what he was referring to in the famous subtitle to his masterpiece, The Treatise? I've actually written it down here. He describes his treatise as an attempt to introduce the experimental method of reasoning into moral subjects. Was he trying to make uh, philosophy scientific? Was that his idea? Well, moral subjects, of course, he intended very broadly. He would have included under that everything we now call politics. He would have included uh, anything we would call psychology and as well as anything we would call moral philosophy. And he did want to make these more scientific in a certain sense than they had ever been. What he says is that when you approach these subjects, you find that people who usually talk seriously and take evidence into account start making wild statements without any real evidence. They start preaching at us rather than telling us what things are like. They lay down laws for us rather than looking at the facts and that we ought to look at the facts in respect to political life and human affairs, just as we do in the natural sciences. There's an implied theory of language and meaning, isn't there, in, in, in this approach that we are now talking mm. about? Because uh, he very definitely thought that in order to, for a word to mean anything at all, it had to relate to a specific idea. And for an idea to have real content, it had to be derived from experience. So in effect, Hume is saying, if you want to know what a word means, look for the experience from which it's derived. If you can't find an experience or an observation from which it derives, then it doesn't mean anything. That, that, so there's this whole theory of meaning, is there not, underlying 
the philosophical approach that you've just been outlining. Yes, he draws a distinction, and he's very keen on this, although he doesn't mention it specifically very often, between talking and thinking. We're thinking only when we're operating with clear ideas which have a real source in experience. But he suggests that much of the time we're talking away and we're using what are really completely confused notions which have no real foundation in experience. If he looked at our contemporary political life and our contemporary talk, he'd find, I think, that it was full of notions which people use completely unreflectively. If you ask what the foundation in experience was of, let us say, ideas like social justice or ideas like accountability, uh, you might find it extremely difficult to see what the actual factual situation was that these were referring what to. What they concretely what mean. What they concretely mean. And yeah. one of his main points is we should look and see what things concretely mean. You'd be absolutely horrified by much of what now passes for literary criticism, for example. That was something he was very interested in. But he thought you had to relate it very concretely to literature. And now it becomes so much of a rather bad philosophy, full of expressions, which Hume, I think, would very rapidly show, have no meaning on, on his theory of meaning. It led him to develop something that came subsequently to be known as Hume's Fork. He said of any given body of ideas that when you're approaching it for the first time, you must ask yourself two main questions. Uh, do these ideas concern matters of fact, in which case do they rest on observation and experience? Or do they concern the relations between ideas, as in mathematics and logic? If the answer to both those main questions is no, then he says, Commit those writings to the flames because they can contain nothing but sophistry and illusion. He was a great, as you've just said, clearer away of intellectual rubbish, uh, not only in philosophy and politics, but in religion and all sorts of other fields. Do you think that in the history of philosophy, that's one of his most important uh, functions, so to speak, that he was a clearer away of illusions? I'm pretty sure about that. The other thing was that there's one particular illusion he's constantly clearing away, and that is that we can prove a great many things which we daily believe. He's constantly showing that really we cannot demonstrate even such facts as that things exist externally to us or that they continue to exist when we're not looking at them, or, or again, that some things are necessarily connected with other things. And uh, this means that he often sounds extremely sceptical, and indeed he sometimes does express himself in a very sceptical way. But he thinks that it's impossible for any human being to be an all-and-all-out sceptic. Inevitably, you, you have to believe, you have to act like any other human being. And a certain measure of scepticism, what he calls mitigated scepticism, is very useful because it prevents you from falling into the trap of large ideologies, large ideas of every sort, which have no real foundation in experience. You will say to yourself, well, look, I'm not really totally able to demonstrate the sun will rise tomorrow. Perhaps it won't. And why should anybody that's in that position think that they can say something about the total existence of the world or some very elaborate concept of this kind? Yeah. 